Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE live in San Francisco for the Red Hat Summit. This is Silicon Angle's theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by co-host, uh, Stu Miniman from Wikibon, filling in for Dave Vellante, and our next guest is Paul Comier, the president in, of products and technologies at Red Hat. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Um, you know, we were just talking Pleasure. before we came on, uh, we're old school guys, well old school, I guess we're older, older than the young guns here in the DevOps world, but man, what a world we're living in right now. 10th year of Red Hat Summit. Um, so much is happening just in the past short, short five, seven years. Uh, major shift, the sea change is happening, the transformation, whatever you want to call it. It is unearthing massive innovation, great disruption, commoditization, yet opportunity on the business model side. So really, really amazing. So I want to get your, your first impression of, of the show here today. What is the vibe here? And what's that in context to, to this inflection point? And talk about why this moment in time is so special. You know, I, I, think, I think the reason um, why this is so special is the vibe here. If you look at it, um, you know, this is really the first, the first summit where um, on one hand we're, we're saying that Linux has been really the driver of the innovation, but on the other hand, there's all this excitement around the open source technologies that are surrounding Linux. You know, where there's a lot of talk here about platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, cloud, containers. It's all, it's all driven by Linux, but it's all expanding of where open source is really going within the infrastructure. When we, when we first started, I've been, at, I've been at Red Hat for going on 13 years now. When we first started, we used to have this vision of the entire infrastructure being open source. We're here. Think yeah. about that, yeah. you know? It's more than prime time, it's more than ready, it's certainly been changing. And I remember the days we were going back, talking before we came on, when I was in, in college, they actually couldn't use the word Unix because it was an AT&T trademark, they actually called it Xenu, which is Unix spelled backwards. We that, although we did use kind of the syntax, but the world that shifted with Linux was really a major, major point. And from there, so much has happened. But now, with software, with virtualization, with all the innovations at the hardware level, with convergence, open compute, all these things, it really is a perfect storm. So I want to ask you, what are you looking at as a product and a technologist leading an open source company and its community? What are you looking at as the killer disruption point right now? Is it the software per se? Is it necessarily the people, all of the above? What's your take on that? You know, I, I mentioned it this morning in my keynote. I, I actually think we've actually gone through one of the killer disruption points. And I think when virtualization got integrated in with Linux, I think that was the inflection point. Because really, you know, when, when, we, started, when we started Linux, I'd like to say we were really revolutionary and visionary and we had this whole, we were going to get here. It was purely a commodity play. It was commoditizing the compute layer, and Linux combined with x86 did that commoditization. But what happened is all the, all the um, from there all the uh, R and D, all the innovation happened on Linux. When virtualization hit, you could now spin up an operating system in a matter of seconds. And I think that's really the inflection point when things happen. That's when really the inflection point with actually the move to the cloud and where cloud development happened. I, I personally think that was one of the big inflection points the, here. The other thing I want to ask you is, is that you know the old the old um, uh, rap around open source was, hey, you know, it's a cheap alternative uh, to X or Y or Z. Now you mentioned kind of it's more than prime time. It's bulletproof. You guys have certainly a life cycle that's supported out in the past a decade in some cases uh, with with Red Hat. But now you have DevOps, which is essentially a software paradigm programming infrastructure in context to deploying applications. Now that's pretty mind blowing, right? So okay, okay if, if we believe that DevOps is important, how is that shaping some of the components in the cloud, like OpenShift in context to OpenStack, and, and the landscape around it? You guys still got the competitors, you got alternative approaches, open core, peer plays. How do you, how do you talk to customers about that? Because they, they might not be following the inside baseball of that. I mean, if, if you really break apart DevOps a bit, I mean, Linux started on the ops side, right? So Linux really, Linux really, you know, leveled the playing field for the for the operations department to really get um, a world class operating system across commodity high, uh, hardware. The reason why we acquired JBoss eight years ago was for the dev side of the equation. So our developers, you know, our developers said, you know, we we started to go out to our customer base and they and they said, look, we've been running on the Linux platform. Now I have all these developers that have to develop applications. I'm certainly not going to do it on .NET. And so that's where we went with JBoss. And if you look at 
because to take it one step further, you look at OpenShift, we take advantage of, of features and functions from the Linux operating systems, th things like SE Linux, C groups, as well as from the JBoss side. And what's really mind blowing as we go on, we, we talk about XTAS, we start to bring those enterprise class services like messaging and data caching, things like that, that have been in the software development stacks today, we start to bring those to the PaaS platform. That's what's really mind blowing. So we're putting together the Linux world, the app server world, and then the services that go with that app server world together on one platform to really change the paradigm. So, so let's take that through. Let's go back a little bit of a history to, to get to the next question, which is Red Hat, the old days, here's some, I won't say floppy disk, but CD-ROMs. Now you're um, really showing you know, you know, So, <laughs> five and a quarter, uh, and then three and a half. So, but you know, had to load it, you load it up in the server, it was out in the back room, but then your business model changed to subscription. Okay, that was a genius move, congratulations on, on your part to bring that over. But now the cloud offers the same alternative on the vehicle side of distribution. It might not be, the younger generation guys aren't, they're not sitting there going, hey, I want to upload patches, they want version control. The modern era is upon us, so okay, right. open source is now ready for prime time. So talk Talk about that next opportunity. How do you get that next magic that Red Hat established with your business model that was so successful and certainly accelerated well, I, the game? I think what we talked about here at the summit, we, we're talking about a lot, containers is where that next magic happens. I look at containers as a way for the application to seamlessly get to the cloud. So you, you think about that. What is the container? What is the container? It's a different packaging paradigm for the application where I now bring in just the right part of the operating system that I need for that application. So I, I actually link in some of the user space pieces that I need for that application. But the interesting part is that's now one object. So I can now electronically transport that around wherever I want to go. I, so, so if you think about today, if you look from a user's perspective to go to one of the cloud providers to spin up a VM and then they go spin up their an ISV application and how they're or any application and how they're going to do that. It's pretty it's pretty cumbersome. But now if I have that as one object now that I can move around electronically, changes the game. I, I really do think. But in 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 people say, wow, well Linux has has a, has adopted. No, Linux has been the adoption, the driving force. We have the containers with this because that the model of the cloud. And so I, I really think this as as big a disruptor as virtualization because it's all about getting the app to the four footprints that I talk about. Virtual, I mean physical, virtual, private, and public cloud. And, and that's, it's going to change a lot from here and I think this is going to drive that, the hybrid cloud even more uh, from here on. So Paul, I want to talk a little bit about the open source ecosystem. You've been involved for a long time. You know, you think back, IBM made a huge commitment. Companies like HP helped drive uh, you know, Red Hat's adoption. You, you look at this show, Cisco gave a keynote this morning. Cisco, a couple of years ago, if you told me they were going to heavily embrace open source, I would have been skeptical. Uh, even Microsoft now has found that, you know, that open source is this great new thing that they've uh, suddenly discovered, and even Oracle is uh, in many ways uh, part of the open source community. How do you see you know, this embrace of open source kind of across the entire software world uh, you know, impacting the community? Well, first of all, I don't think you have any choice. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be in the software industry and you don't know how to traverse an open source, you're not gonna be in the software industry. And so, but I, I do think it's changing it a bit because um, I think as, as the bigger enterprises, enterprises come into the, the open source world, we have to really all adapt and we're sort of running things a little. You're seeing, you're seeing the advent of consortiums now and that's, that's sort of a throwback from, from the olden days when you know, they had consortiums to drive multiple companies together as, to, as opposed to a true open source community where the best code wins. And so, so it's, it's, changing it, it's changing it a bit, um, but I just think we all have to be very careful that it doesn't bring it back to where we were in the 80s. I, I, we, we have to be very careful about that. I mean, we're still the only company that's pure, a pure 100% open source company. Everything we do on either side of the equation always goes back to the community, and that's, to us, that's the best model, and not everyone, not really most other people don't run that model. Okay, so, so cloud is under your purview. 
Um, you know, we, we've heard a lot today. You you, you talked about there, there, there's private cloud, there's public cloud, and you know Linux is across all the major public cloud providers, and you know obviously you know in, in all the private environments um, is. Red Hat in general just agnostic uh, to provide the best solution to all of those environments, or you know, is, is, is there any way that you want to push one vision versus another? No, we th we think all environments are going to make one environment, and so you know, I think when people started first talking about the cloud, there was a lot of talk of people were going to move their entire workload to the public cloud. It's just not practical. It's not practical. You know, we were just talking earlier. We we come from the same era almost, and. <laughs> there's still there's still people running bare metal, yep. and and people it's, you know it's not going to go away. Virtualization, as VMware brought it to the market, it's almost traditional virtualization now, but it's it's not going to go away tomorrow. And I think you know all the way across from private to public cloud, people are going to be forced and want to run in those four footprints, but they want to be able to manage it as one. Even in the public cloud, CIOs are not going to let you know if they have an application that's running out in someone else's public cloud and that's the hole that they get broken into, CIO is still on the hook for that. Right. They have to be able to manage it even when it's out in the public cloud. So we think we think it's those four footprints that just melt into one environment, and I, and I think that's really the way forward. So, so do you think with containers we actually have Will this deliver the portability? Because uh, you know, when I talk to companies, you know, moving from if I have my test environment in Amazon to get it into my private environment, that that's not seamless today. It, I, I think it. I think it depends on how you define portability. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it will it will really help the portability in those four types of footprints that I talked about. But still, what's running underneath is still very, very important to give your application a solid platform to run on. All the things we're doing today with platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, we're trying to abstract all the things underneath to the developer, but nonetheless, all the things underneath are still very important for that stable platform. Okay, so we, we talked to Jim Whitehurst some about OpenStack, said we have some actual customers that played in production, you know, paid dollars uh, yeah. for doing that, but a lot of proof of concepts. You know, where do you see the industry needing to mature OpenStack? What needs to be done to have this so that this is, you know, an option that we're going to see a huge inflection point in, say, the next 12 to 18 months? I think more iteration around deployment tools, management tools, things like that, um, more applications getting there, more of the ecosystem getting there. Look, this is exactly how Linux started. This is exactly how Linux, and everybody, you know, I've had a lot of comments, well you guys seem to be doing a pretty good job. It's pretty easy because we've done it once already. And when we first started Linux, it was, exact, it was the exact same way. We'd put engineers on customer site, to get the operating system tweaked just right, and then the tools started to grow, the packaging started to grow. The same thing's happening with OpenStack. It's just going to happen faster. It's just going to happen faster because we've all been through it. There's more developers on board, et cetera. Paul, I want to ask you a um, competition question, landscape question from, from two perspectives. One, as someone leading the organization, you have a lot of folks who look to you for leadership inside the organization around making the, the tough calls, right, around directions, and um, we're in a very dynamic marketplace, a lot of unification, a lot of elastic, a lot of agile, all this, all these, uh, that's the buzzword, drinking game, bingo, people play, um, but it's pretty serious, a lot of money on the table, a lot of enterprises have, have Red Hat, and they want to go to the cloud. They see Amazon forcing that change. I know you guys have a, a relationship with them, but they also want to look under the hood. Composite application, you mentioned application is really the key to success there. So what is the, what is the competitive mindset for you guys? What do you worry about? What do you focus in on to tell your team? And then how do you execute that in market from a competitive standpoint? There's a lot of stuff going on around Red Hat, around the, the trends you guys are riding. I, I, think, I think the biggest thing that, personally, that I worry about is that, um, as open source has become much more mainstream, um, it's disrupting a lot of the traditional players. And I worry a bit about the traditional players starting to drag open, open source back into the, the games of the proprietary world. That's what I worry about. And because we have to be very, very careful about that because it's a complicated, it's a complicated um, topic. And so keeping it open, Keeping a develop one open development community, it's really, really important, and we, we have to be careful that. Do you mean that the trickery thing. around the proprietary lock-in, or is it more market tactics around FUD or, or both? I, I think it's I think it's more market tactics around FUD or both. I mean, if you look back in history, Unix started as an open platform, and uh, then everyone, including the company that I started with, DEC, that I, it's near and dear to my heart. 
all the companies took it in and put their own isms in and nothing nothing worked they were all different and i think that's what we have to be careful of. We have to look at that history and make sure we don't go back to the Unix days of the age. Well, those days are interesting. That's, those were best of breed days. They all had their own silos. HP and the workstation guys made a big part of that. So, so now we're seeing to be busting those silos now with the environment we're in now. Um, are you worried about cloud? Are you not worried about cloud? Are you worried about something else? What, what is your No, I, I, I think cloud is great. I mean, I, my, I think cloud opens up the whole universe for the applications. I think that model is, is the way to go. What, I, what I'm worried about is quasi open source offerings that are billed as open source and people thinking they're open source and then getting back locked into that vertical stack. That's what we have to be careful of. Talk about how you deal with complacency in managing this environment, because you're dealing with a lot of new technology, a lot of emerging tech. Um, you know, you, getting complacent is um, a thing that could lull you into into a disaster situation, the frog getting boiled in the water, so to speak. How do you manage that? Well, I can tell you, we were just chatting about it earlier, I can tell you how I personally deal with it inside of Red Hat. I started my career at DEC, and I tell the guys in my own group all the time, I said, look, I started at DEC, we had the best operating systems, the best networking, the best servers, the best everything, and we're not here anymore. And so we're not going to let that happen at Red Hat. You know, we will not get complacent. I'm the most, I'm the most paranoid guy on the planet. And um, we're always looking for new angles, new opportunities, and we're always, most of all, ensuring that it stays open. And that's something we concentrate on. Let's talk about Microsoft, okay? You mentioned .NET earlier, or someone mentioned .NET. The developer market is really hot right now, so you guys are a big winner in that with open source and have a lot of success, that trajectory with that. Uh, everyone wants to win the developers. Win the developer ecosystem, constantly hearing everyone talk about. Um, you mentioned DEC. DEC had VMS. Uh, Windows has one letter more than that, Windows NT. It's not a coincidence. You know, yeah, <laughs> I know, that's why I brought it up. So that's a little <laughs> trivia there. VMS and one letter four is what Microsoft wanted to be like VMS, which is a great operating system. Um, so so um, with Microsoft, you're seeing new things coming from them. You've seen the leadership change. you got Satya Nutella, uh, cloud guy. You see what they've done with open source. They've donated reference design on Azure to open compute and some recent maneuvers around being more open. Um, at what point do these developer communities of past, like .NET and other ones, maybe even some say Java, right, need to evolve to a modern era? And, and, and how do you deal with that potential change? Because now with persistent uh, SSDs, for instance, now we have unlimited potentially persistent memory. That changes the operating system equation, where disk used to be the, the right, winner, right. hyperscale, the web 2.0 companies. So all this is going to go on, but the developers are going to be the ones taking advantage of these new technologies. So, so what is this modern developer profile look like in your mind? I mean, the modern developer profile today, I mean, and, and this is, I think, why Linux is driving a big part of, if not all, of where it's going, because it's about the developer. The developer has access to everything. The developer today, you know, the developer of the past, we used to say, you will write in this language, you will write in this framework. The developer today wants to write in what they want to write, the framework they want to write in. And so, that's what you have to support. You have to have that capability to support the framework that they want to write in. Node.js wasn't even around. You know, it might have been around in cult form five or so years ago, but it wasn't anywhere near it is for it today. So you've got to be able to support that. You've got to be able to have the frameworks that are flexible enough to allow the developer to write where they want to write. And I mean, in terms of Microsoft, I mean, I think Microsoft's making some good changes. I, I, I think you've seen Microsoft much more open. I talked about it this morning in my keynote that, um, you know, when we first started Linux, you know, I think Microsoft looked at us as a full frontal attack. I think, I think Microsoft has gotten to the point that Linux is in the data center. It's, it's, it's just here, and, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. And I think I got to give Microsoft credit for that. I, I think, I think. Um, I think Satya's probably had a lot to do with that, and I, th I think that's a, it's a good thing. So when I say the word data center operating system, what comes to your mind? Physical, virtual, public, <laughs> and private cloud. <laughs> that is the data center. Okay, so let's talk about software-defined data center. So now it brings up all kinds of new software approaches, like configuration, automation, orchestration. Those are important things. That's not necessarily cloud, that's on-premise. Right. So it could be in the cloud. When you, when you go to software, that means it could be. It's, it's very, even, look, from a storage perspective, 
it's very tough to stuff a t storage box down the wire when you want to bring up storage on the other on the other side of that wire, right? So <laughs> sorry to interrupt. But. <laughs> no, no, it's good. But that, but that's that's the challenge. So as as a CIO, what should I be paying attention to if I'm saying, you know what? I have a lot of stuff I'm going to write off. I have new potentially migration paths I'm looking at. I'm looking at refresh cycles. What should I be thinking about? What are the top of mind things around architecture and approaches around software-defined data centers? I, I personally think in the, in the CIOs I meet, this is how they think. You have to look at it from the application perspective. What are the requirements on this application? Are there uptime requirements? Are there security requirements? Are there availability requirements? And then you map that into that architecture and how that fits. And it might even be different requirements at different times of the day, month, year, et cetera. And I, I think that's really have, how you have to look. We talked a lot about that today. It really is about the application. And I think that's what a CIO sort of has to do, that top-down look. So, so Paul, you're, you're, you're very passionate about open source. Uh, we actually, we did a survey about a year ago at Wikibon and asked uh, you know, it was CIOs and infrastructure heads as to you know, how they make their buying decision. And about 15% of them said, you know, I want open source. Uh, there's all these battles in the industry about who's the most open. Is it open source? Is it an open interface? Are APIs enough? Um, you know, wh where does that conversation of open, you know, fit in with the CIO discussions that you're having and, you know, you, you give Microsoft credit, you know, to, for, for being more open, you, you know, you know wh where's that line and what's open and what's not in your not mind? Not too and, much, and, not too much credit. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, I mean, it, it's a great question because a lot of people feel that open source is just seeing the code. Having the code visible doesn't necessarily mean open, but not having it visible is closed. I mean, if you really look across it, it's the ability to see the code, it's the ability to use the code, be able to reuse the code, it's the ability for APIs not to be hidden and published and not changed, but it's also the ability from a company perspective to support what the customer wants. So I'll take it all the way to that end for us. So for example, we have a management solution called CloudForms. We support bare metal, we support a VMware environment, we support traditional virtualization, and we support a Red Hat traditional virtualization, we support a private cloud, and we'll support multiple public clouds. If people want to run VMware, we're okay with that. We can manage that with our, with our product line. That's part of being open as well, as giving the customer that choice. We, we, integrate, we integrate OpenStack with vSphere, for example. If that's what the customers want, that's also part of being open as well. Paul, what are you most excited about? I mean, you have a lot of history, and I love talking with you because you, you, know, you have that perspective through multiple cycles of innovation, uh, ups and downs. Um, but right now, given where we're at today, within Red Hat, what are you most excited about in the show here? Is it RHEL 7? Is it the developer community? And then what are you excited about outside of Red Hat that you're watching? I, th I, think, I think inside of Red Hat is that um, I'm most excited, excited about the fact that people are starting to see that the innovation is emanating from open source. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time where people say, oh, you're just a Linux company, it's just a Linux company. Well, now Linux has driven all that innovation with trying to kind of prove to the world that we can bring that innovation to the market. I'm really excited about that because this feels like the coming out of that because in just one short year, you know, things like infrastructure as a service, platform as a service have gone so much further. That's what I'm excited about from here. From, from an industry perspective, it's sort of a similar thing because um, I'm really excited about it. It's no longer, when we, we first started the journey down the Linux path, we used to have to go in and convince customers it was secure, it was enterprise ready, it was safe. It's off the table now, it's not even a question anymore. And now it's just a matter of what more can you bring me to help me solve my problems. It's just, it's just a given that open source is in the mainstream and Linux is in the mainstream. That's what's going to drive us because all of that stuff about convincing the people of the world that you know all those other things I talked about, secure, safe, etc., gone. Now we just bring them innovation, and we know with open source we can just crush it with bringing as more innovation than anyone else. I got to say, one thing that's really been intoxicating and riveting at the same time is the whole DevOps movement and watching. You mentioned Node. It's been fun to watch that evolution, how relevant that's been on the real time side. Certainly with the with the advances of JavaScript at the client side, it's been pretty amazing. Um, but the same thing I want to talk about is the role of data. So I want to get your perspective as a guy in the computer science field for many generations. Not many generations. Uh, uh, <laughs> open source generations. <laughs> it's like a couple of decades. Um, Data is now, it used to be you store data on disk, right? You put it on the wire, you said, 
pump it out to the hinterlands, the data warehouses, send some reports, schemas, and you've seen the, the cycles of data. Um, but if DevOps is to cloud as dev data, if you want to just call it a new term, but like the ability to program with data, because companies are now becoming data full, meaning right. they are now dealing with massive data. So it's not so much which containers I buy to and infrastructure and software like Cloudera and whatnot to use for the data. Data is now a critical asset of right. their business. You're seeing Facebook, LinkedIn, others use their data, and Twitter just bought a company today called Gnip. You're seeing the analytics and the insight becoming the new plutonium for value, right? So, uh, and in the architecture, where does that fit in, in your mind? I mean, I, I, think it, I think it fits in, we talked a lot about the app, having the app have the access to that data, but the data has, I think, the interesting part about the data is the many sources that the data can come from. So it used to be, you know, the data was from, you talked about it, it was on your disk. The data can be somewhere out on the net right now that you want to use as part of your analysis on the particular application that you're working for. So the ability, the ability to access the data in as wide a, a swath as you can, that's, I think that's important. The ability to store the data and the ability to retrie retrieve that data I think those are the things that are really driving it, but it's it's about the app having the ability and the access to this data to get things done in real time. I mean, also that, an, that analysis is more and more about the real-time analysis. The people that are going to win here are the people that can do that real-time analysis. Yeah, I'm still struggling. I always try, this is something I think about a lot is, okay, if, you got, if the operating system is evolving to be distributed in the cloud and premise, the four things you mentioned, uh, private, public, um, uh, Private. Physical, vir yeah. physical, virtual, private, public. Okay, and across those those pillars, if you will, or segments, data is everywhere. So, how does data fit into the new operating system architecture? Well, that's where software-defined storage comes into play, because you now your application now has to have access to that data wherever it lives. So, if if data is on one side of the link or the other side of the link, you have to have a common storage namespace for the app to really have access to that data no matter where it lives. And that's why that's why it's all moving to a software layer. I mean, it, you know, hardware is still going to be underneath, but the hardware that's underneath matters less and less and less every day. You know, what's interesting, uh, Stu and I were talking uh, before we came on today, and certainly Dave and I, Dave Vellante and I always talk about this all the time, is some companies have a lot more marketing budget than others, and some have different approaches to competitive strategy. Um, in the cloud, obviously you see Cloud Foundry, you got IBM and HP and others out there, but all, they all have to huddle around the water cooler called open source if they want to play. Um, so uh, you guys are kind of like Amazon. You're, you're humble, but you don't overspend on a lot of, I call, I don't want to say frivolous marketing, but most tech geeks look at marketing as frivolous. Um, so they say, why don't you spend money on marketing? But, but your competition is spending money on marketing. So if you had unlimited marketing budget, what would you do to get the word out for cloud? I mean, and Red Hat's uh, mojo. I mean, the, the, the word out I, I would get out for with unlimited marketing is be wary of these quasi open source things. That's 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 the message that what I would get out. How I, how I would get it out is um, is is more for the developer out there. I mean, I, I, let me give you an example. I know it's a little vague, but let me give you an example. When we first did our PaaS offering, OpenShift. We did it out on the cloud. We didn't do it as a product. We, have, we actually had no intention of doing it as a product. We started up as a free service for the developer because we wanted the developers on, open, on Red Hat Technologies. And after about six or nine months, we just got inundated by our customer base saying, I want this behind our firewall because they had seen it out in the cloud. I mean, that is the way to get your word out. It's not unlike open source. The best solution wins. Put it out there. And also one that has longevity too, because you see a lot of banks and stuff who are now using open source banks. A lot of vertical markets are all adopting the open source, so it has to kind of be supported. Exactly. Let's exactly. talk about the quasi open source. What did you mean by that when you said that you'd be wary of quasi open source? Can you be specific, just to do a drill down on that? You mean like, Open core? You mean just like well, head fake or? I mean, I, I mean, I mean. Well, I'll take it right to the heart. Let's let, let's right. we'll talk a little bit about Cloud Foundry, right? Let's talk a little bit about Cloud Foundry. You got, you got all these. You yeah, guys, we love you, talking about Cloud Foundry. You, got, you guys are you guys are leading me there. You're going to get me in trouble. But <laughs> okay, go ahead. It's okay. But you We're know, your friends. You, we'll, you see, we'll, you the parachute see. will open. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, you see all these big guys. You see all these big guys sort of rallying around Cloud Foundry. You know, you've got a little. PaaS layer, you look at some of these companies, and what I've seen is you see a little PaaS layer that they're all going to agree upon, and then it's this big stack of proprietary stuff on top. 
Well, they're each going to take that proprietary layer and they're going to bring it in and build their own stuff on top. You think they're going to interoperate across all of those? Probably not. That sounds a lot like the Unix days of the past to me. And so that's what I, that's sort of what I what I mean by that. I mean, yeah. when you I I've, I've said this for a long time that it's very difficult for a company to draw a line and say everything below the line is open and everything above the line is closed. It confuses you, it confuses your employees, your developers, and your customers. Yeah, so, so Paul, I guess, you know, we, we've talked to IBM quite a bit, and you know, one of the reasons they joined is to try to keep that open. I mean, obviously IBM was heavily involved with you guys early, they've been involved in OpenStack, and they're involved with Cloud Foundry. So, I mean, can't they help, you know, keep that solution open? What, what, what is the solution? Is the solution the thin layer? Or is the solution the thin layer that's part of the bigger stack with it? I mean, I think that's, I'm not answering that question for anyone. I think that's a yeah. question you it's just a have good to rhetorical, ask yourself. It's a good rhetorical question, but I'll, I'll frame it this way. So there's always a line of abstraction where if you abstract away complexity and the functionality is solid, no one really cares. If the value's there, as long as it interoperates. So the one trend we're seeing with say Oracle, for instance, is they have the, and the multi-purpose, uh, purpose-built systems, fully integrated, they call they want to be the iPhone for the enterprise. Um, some customers are buying that's that. Okay. That's okay, that, but that's okay. If customers want to buy that, then I think that's fine, and customers should be able to buy that. And let the market decide what the right way to go on that is. Yeah, we asked um, uh, Padra this morning about from Cisco about that her philosophy here, and she was great to see her here, by the way, Cisco yeah, was endorsing the, uh, you guys and being part of the ecosystem. Again, another sign of a big whale, like what Microsoft's doing on their end, Cisco's on there, and I asked her, the era of communication is different. The old days when, when, when the head fakes were going on in the open source community, everyone knew about it, but the main press was okay. But now it's social media. Right. Everyone's watching. Exactly. It's on Twitter, it's trending. Exactly. So it's hard to pull those old tricks of slowing stuff down in the standards bodies, is it? No, it's, it's, still, it's still possible. I, 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 I just, you know, one of the things I want everybody to just think about that line. Yeah. You know, if you're willing to open up things below the line, why aren't you willing to open up things above the line? Yeah. Why, why, what, what's, the re, what's the reason and the, the thought process around that? Cannibalization, fear, uh, other things, a lot of variety of reasons. Well, we got, we get, we're, uh, getting, open, we're getting ready it? to get the hook from the handlers. Um, so I want to ask you one final question. Explain to the folks out there uh, two things. The bumper sticker for the show, so the car that's leaving, what's on the bumper sticker for this year's Red Hat Summit? And why is this point in time so important for Red Hat Summit? I, I think, as I said, I think this is the coming out, one of the coming out parties where open, stack, where open source is really driving the move to the cloud. The bumper sticker will take your app to the cloud. That should be the bumper sticker coming out of here. Okay, Paul Cummings, the president of Red Hat on technologies and platforms. Obviously, uh, the operating system of the future is being developed in the open, in the crowd. Uh, full transparency, and it's going to be fun to watch. We love following it on the cube, obviously. Great theater for us and, and benefits to the users, and certainly the developers at the center of the value proposition. At the end of the day, agile, elastic, flexible, whatever you want to call it, this is the model that we're talking about here inside the cube, live in San Francisco at the Red Hat Summit. This is the cube. We'll be right back with our next guest after the short break. <laughs>